I should say is um, a lot of what I've done is, uh, do I have to say got it here? Probably. Yeah, okay. Um, was taken from the meeting last year, which I don't think I attended, but I think I watched the video of. So the process in Audacity is, is very similar to last year. Some of the tricks like the plugins are the same and the Zoom toggle, I think I got from that. Um, so I should recognize that effort and, and that was a great learning experience. Um, but I've taken it a bit further with uh, using R to, to get my data ready for, for eBird. So, so I'll, uh, I can, uh, I can show you guys if you'd like. Just log into my other computer here because I do have some notes. So yeah, like I said, um, I record with, uh, I have a Senko D2 hypercardioid shotgun mic. Um, and I connect that to, I can probably grab it since it's not running. It just, uh, it just goes into the zoom recorder. Where's this zoom recorder with, uh, like an XLR cable that plugs into my outlet on my deck and an SD card in every night. And I just, um, turn it on. Um, and the Zoom recorder has, gives it phantom power to the, to the microphone. Um, and uh, the microphone is in a bucket. I don't know why I put it in a bucket. It's not a flower pot microphone. It's directional anyways, but I figured that might uh, block out some noise from the side and it helps to stand. And then if it's raining, I can put saran wrap on top of the bucket. So um, I, I put it in a bucket. There's foam inside the bucket. Uh, I don't know why I do that. There's no scientific reason. I just figure that... Uh, you know, stops other sounds reflecting into the microphone. Um, so I set it up nightly um, when I'm home and when the weather isn't atrocious. I did try some automated recording on my laptop last year in late summer when I went to uh, visit my parents for a few days and there was a huge storm and my laptop got fried. I had it under a, under a chair, under a tarp and the whole thing got soaked. <laughs> so, um, so, so that's when I bought the, uh, had to buy the recorder and uh, started doing it that way. Um, yeah, so it's on my deck railing as high up as I can get it. I do have some tall pine trees. And so I think that does affect some of the stuff I get. I think sometimes I get stuff that's grounded, not necessarily in flight, which is cool. I think that's part of the fun. You're, you're trying to guess what's going on up there. Um, and uh, so when I press start, I'll record that start time because that's that's important for everything I do later. Um, I'll record the, uh, the start time. Uh, and then with the gain, I only turn up the gain about halfway. Um, I, uh, I find with without amplifying, like if I'm not trying to amplify it too much, I find it must, much easier, much nicer to listen to. It's and uh, I think sometimes when you amplify things, you're just amplifying the noise. So you're not making the call stand out anymore versus the background noise. So I try to keep my gain, I keep it at half actually. Like it goes up to 12, I keep it at six. And that was trial and error, figuring out what, what seemed to work best. What, uh, why, what were you trying to avoid with the gain at half I, Yeah, I think when you crank up the gain, you crank up the noise. So the call doesn't, yeah. the call is not, you're not gonna hear the call any better versus the background hiss, I think. Right, mm -hmm. there's like, it's, that, that's my experience anyways. I've settled, like I keep, I started out really high gain thinking, oh, I'm gonna amplify everything and get these birds that are way overhead. But the more I do it, the more, the more I seem to be running lower gain. Um, and uh, it's like, it's the same thing. I have this internal debate and I'm not a, I'm not, I'm not a scientist or anything, but we talk about different, uh, different angles on your microphone catching more sky, right? And you might have an old bird mic that might pick up calls from further away, but it's also bringing in more noise from further away. So like, I'm, I'm not sure if, I, I'm not sure, you know, if it's, um, I'm not sure if you're actually gonna get more calls cause you're gonna get more noise, right? Like it's, uh, I'm sure people have actually compared certain microphones, but um, yeah. And when I went, I went with a shotgun mic because like, I'm, like I said, I'm not doing it for research purposes. And I just wanted to collect some nice quality samples that I could have fun looking at. So, so really that, and then I, try, I tried initially to make an old mic and I, uh, and I failed miserably. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, on a tip, typical morning uh, after stopping the recording, I will uh, pop out the SD card. Usually I'm up, I don't know, like 
you know, six o'clock. But if I get up at seven, no big deal. I'll pop out the SD card and um, I throw it on my computer. And with a Zoom recorder, I get like three or four, three to five files for a whole night. It doesn't do it all in one file. So I guess the first thing I'll show is I just have a, um, I just have a script, a Python script um, that will take these files. Um, sorry if I show it to you. So it'll take these files and append it into one file from my review in Audacity. And um, it's the ones commented out are sometimes, you know, sometimes I'm only getting, like if I forget to do it till 11 or something, I might only get two files. And other times in winter when it's so dark, like I said, I've been doing it all year, I might get five because it's dark from six to, or like from four to, you know, eight in the morning, right? So, so I just comment out the number I have and then we can just run this now. It takes no time at all. Like I just, I just run it and it takes those and it'll go through and it'll stitch them all together. So that's something people might find useful if they're getting multiple, multiple files for one, one evening. Um, yeah, and then uh, it'll be done in a second here. Should be, never do live demos. <laughs> Um, can I just interrupt a second? Ian, um, just so you know, the majority of the noise you're getting is from your recording device. Uh, the preamp, preamps uh, leak electricity. They leak electrons into the recording, depending on how well the recording device is manufactured. Um, so um, unless there's a lot of wind, then the, the, the majority of the large majority of the noise is from the preamp. So, so you're yeah. saying I should get a better preamp. That sounds well, like something you, I should explore. Yeah, you know, yeah, a better a better recorder. Yeah, that's more shielded. Um, <laughs> so you're right. When as you turn up the volume, you're absolutely guaranteed to get more noise uh, because it's all coming from your recording device. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I don't have a problem with noise, really. I mean, obviously, if I can reduce that, that would be great, right? So if I could find a recorder that reduces noise, it'd be great. And I could maybe turn up the gain a little bit more, right? So I think that that, that might be where I would explore. But I, I um, yeah. Um, so yeah, that's good to note. Thanks for that. Um, yeah, so it's done. And here in the folder, and now it's made... Uh, I don't know if I've got a file size here. Yeah, it's made this one here. So then um, what I'll do is I will rename this um, with the uh, time I started. I'm trying to remember when I started last night. I think it was 32. And it's got to be in that format. And the reason I do this is because this is what I learned last year is there's a plugin that if you name your file that way in Audacity, any to, it'll tell you exactly what time it is where your cursor is in Audacity. Uh, I don't use that. That's not part of my, um, that's not required for the scripting I do, but it's nice to know if I have a recording. It's nice to know what time of night that call was at. And it's also helps me, tells me when to end. Like right now, if I'm past six in the morning, um, I, I, I should I should end it. Well, I think I'm ending it at five in the morning actually. So I can just check and I'm like, oh, I'm at 448. Okay, I'll go to five and then call it quits. So, um, when I do that, I fire up Audacity. I open it in Audacity. Uh, this is last night. We'll just leave it open. Um, uh, let me see, let me try to figure out where I'm at here. Uh, yeah, just a second. Um, yeah, so then the presets I use in Audacity, I've, I think I've gotten them out of the, this group has given them to me or YouTube has given them to me. And I use 512 um, window type. Black one seems to be the best for me. It does change when you change it. Um, and I do zero to, to 10,000 Hertz. Um, and this seems to work for the two zooms I toggle between. I, to I toggle between 500 of a second in the default zoom. And I have 15 seconds screen on the top on my 15 seconds of uh, time on my screen at the same time, and so I don't have to touch these settings when I toggle in between the two. This works for this works for everything, which which makes it efficient. Um, 
And so the Zoom toggle, I was gonna show Zoom toggle. Zoom toggle, I think is in um, references, uh, tracks in the Zoom toggles here. So this is where I set my 500s of second and my default Zoom. And these allow me to use hotkeys to switch back and forth quickly. What, what keystrokes do you use? So I made them myself. So I think if you go, that was the next thing I was gonna show, the hotkeys would be on keyboard. And I use Shift A and Shift Z. Shift Z. Um, let me see where they are. So Shift A is my label, and then uh, Shift Z is my Zoom toggle. And I'll show you how that works. Um, I'll show you how that works right now. So this is last night's recording. It was slow, but it was um, good quality for sound recording because it was cold and the peepers and the frogs were not very active. So let me minimize this. And uh, just, just at four o'clock last night, no wait, 151 stuff. Some stuff went through. Um, so I go through the whole thing, 15 seconds at a time. And one thing I was hoping to ask this group, because I don't know how to do it, is um, I just click on the scroll bar at the bottom to go through, to pan through page by page. I'd rather do that with a keystroke if I can, and I haven't figured that out. Page down. Page down. Yeah. Doesn't, doesn't work for me. Oh, um, <laughs> Maybe check, that's check that big list of keystrokes. Um, you might be able to fix it. Um, but uh, Brian Tinker uh, is a good person to ask about that. Yeah. It's uh, been it's been a like a bee in my bonnet for a <laughs> for he, a he showed time. me a script that he runs that will hold page down down until he pushes something. So if it's a slow night, it'll just keep panning at at yeah. a certain speed at a repeat rate. And and then he if he sees something, then he can hit page up and go back to it real quick. He doesn't even have to flex his finger. Me, I hold the page down down. Hmm, that's good. Great to know. We should, I should, I should, I should ask about that. I will ask about that. So I, yeah, so up to now I've just been clicking through 15, 15 seconds of uh, time and uh, I can get through like a winter night with like one golden night going over and no background noise in 15, 20 minutes. Um, but as soon as like early September rolls around, then I'm stuck for days going through a night, right? So um, that's kind of how fast it takes. It, it takes about 15, 20 minutes to go through the whole thing, but then you get slowed down if there's calls. And if you can't identify those calls and you start Googling, then that, yeah, that just becomes a, that just becomes a huge, a huge, a huge undertaking, right? So um, I go through, right? There's a call. And then I just can toggle back and forth, do shift A to label it. Um, oh yeah, I add a label track. Sorry, I should have shown that. So tracks, add new, add a label track to the bottom. Um, and then I just keep moving on. I wasn't actually sure if that was swings and clutch. I was wondering about rose breast and rose peak, but you know, that's, a, that's a different conversation. Um, yeah, and I just keep going through till I see my next thing. This one I wouldn't zoom into. Um, play it if I want it, if I want to play it. And um, just, yeah, this was me just practicing for this. I would normally not call it twice. I just call it once and go through the whole night like that. Um, So I call that Bay Breasted Warbler. I've got this set down here so I can measure if I want to measure 26. I don't know, I'm, that's it's a little sketchy, but that's what direction says. So, so I call that Bay Breasted Warbler instead of a Z. That one I just called a Warbler. I'm not sure what that is, no idea. That might just be, maybe that should be password. So my labels, I'm using the banding codes. And then when I script this, I have a, a, a text file that takes these in, crosswalks them to uh, common names for eBird. I, I'll show that in a bit. Um, we don't have to go much farther here. This one, what was this one? Oh yeah, I wasn't sure if that was chestnut sided or an oven bird. So I just mm -hmm. called it W and kept moving. Um, w for warbler. That's it, this is oven bird singing. So I have local oven bird in the woodlot behind me. So I'll get these three or four times a night, it'll go up and sing.
So this is at, um, I can't see because at the top of my screen here, this is at, so that uh, little tool, I can go recording time. So that was at 11.38, it was singing, right? So that's what that plugin and, and labeling it, labeling your track with that format and that plugin does that, does that for me. Uh, and then, so with repeat callers, and I think we got to skip forward to uh, four o'clock in the four, sorry, four, not four o'clock, four here. So let's try this. Uh, there's the Virginia rail. I find it fascinating because I'm not sure anymore if they're migrants or they're local birds doing local flights. Like I said, it wasn't a great night for migration. Um, that's that's part of this that I love. I seem to get rails every night. Um, so yeah, I had this one. I didn't know what it was because it's so faint in and out, but then you can see here, there it is. And so I label every subsequent call with a one. And so when I tally this up afterwards, I'm not gonna count this towards my total birds. I'll count this towards my NFC count though. Um, so uh, that's how I do the labeling and there it goes again and that's probably it. And then finally we'll boot forward to the end of the night. And the only other thing I do is um, 427 I think. So you can see the dawn chorus is picking up here. These are robins going. Um, and then, so here I will, I mean, I'll just, I just probably like try to put three robins in or four robins, however many I think. So that's why that's there. It's just, I'm not gonna count this as individual robin call. Um, and then I just put end and then that marks the end of my, uh, that marks the end of my recording session and, or my, my tallying, even though I've got probably half an hour more after it. And then we generate the recording time and see that's, Right at five, five in the morning. So um, not too worried about the astronomical twilight or whatever. Um, I just go until I, uh, I just go until I, cause I figure it's split up now by hour in eBird. They can, whoever analyzes the data can figure that out after the fact. Um, yeah, so I, I just go until the calls are just basically too much. Um, too much to, to handle. Uh, yeah, so that's it. And then after that, so I got that file, I got this label track with all these labels in it. And then I will um, go to, sorry, file export um, labels. And it makes, the, I just save this label track. So then um, I think that brings us to the processing side of things. Um, do, 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 do. So I'll take that label track and I will copy it into my processing folder um, in here. I have here, so label track will go in here. And this is my, uh, I'll close that. This is my uh, R script that takes that label track and puts it into uh, this format right here, which is the format required to upload to um, upload to eBird. You can see all the times for the different birds. Uh, this would be last night's. So not that many calls last night, it was slow. Um, and it requires two things. It doesn't really require this, but um, I built a code correction file for when I make typos. So if, if I call a chipping sparrow and I accidentally put a D instead of an S, it'll make that, that code. Um, just these are some of the errors I've already made this year and uh, this will correct them. Um, that's uh, space delimited. Struggling with the, struggling with this thing up there. Oh, come on. Oh, bear with me. And then, and then the valid codes file the script uses to convert the code to common name for upload. Now I found out it can take banding code as well. So I did this before I knew that. 
Um, and I used to mark midnight because I used to split it at midnight. That's no longer required. That's why that's in there. And then in, if it's a local bird, I also here, it's tab delimited because I was struggling with the figuring out um, commas or I didn't want to be bothered with commas. I'm a bit of a hack. I just smash, <laughs> smash keys in the code until it works. So it's not, it's not elegant. <laughs> it's not consistent. But, um, but I think in theory, the process has, has some merit. Uh, and that's why we're here. So yeah, if it's a local bird, then I have comments, standard comments, the local comments that I'll apply instead of putting an NFC tally on, I'll put, I'll put the local comments on. And this just does that for me. And so I won't go through the R code. I've opened it here. Um, I've opened it here. Um, so the other thing this does is it also, so you run it. And uh, where do my folders go? Wait, wait a second. With R, do you have any like complex setting it up, or is it just like the normal R installation? Like nothing. No, it's nothing pretty, I think it's out of the box. Involved. Out of the box installation. The library packages come in at the start all on their own. You just, um, yeah. I don't think there's anything. Just install R, and it comes with R Studio. Or you might need to install R Studio, and uh -huh. it uh, it goes. Now I'm learning R. This is kind of my project to help me learn R, and so this is why it's uh, it's all over the place. <laughs> it's 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 messy. I, I was a bit reluctant to show it, um, but like I said, I think it's it's a good conversation starter at the very least. Um, yeah. So then it makes this file, and so it'll tally each species for that time period. Um, so you can see I had bird species. I had one, uh, I had two um, from the three o'clock to four o'clock hour. I had one from the four o'clock onwards hour. I had one from the 10 o'clock hour. Um, and and uh, you know, I'm trying to find one, like maybe that Sora, that Sora we had multiple times. So yeah, it's one call, but it's made the, it's made the NFC to three. So um, it called three times, I'm calling it the same bird. And by labeling it that way in Audacity, my script will create this file. And then this file just goes into eBird. Um, do I have, yeah, so da, 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 do I have my eBird account open? So then in eBird, you just go to, um, sorry, just a second, you just go to submit. And then you go to import data, choose file. I've already done, loaded this, so I'm not gonna load it right now, but um, you would navigate to that file in the upload. So you pick that file and then you choose the bottom format, you import. And sometimes it happens really quickly and other times it will, uh, it could take a couple of days if you're in the queue. And then, so if we go to our checklists, trying to remember when that Sora was, that would have been this morning. Was it at two? No. Was it at three? No, uh, no. It must have been at four. No, where is it? Gonna make a liar out of me. Uh, it's there somewhere. There it is. So Sora three. And um, I used to put the weather comments in here. And now I just do the whole night's tally in here. With the weather, uh, I have other R scripts that I run to take all this and put it into a master file on my computer. And uh, with R, I can append the weather from a station 20 minutes away, uh, hourly weather to all my recordings. And so I do that later on in my, I guess, workflows for, for lack of a better, for lack of a better um, word. I, well, I, I did have it in here, but the problem was that weather data is not available in R for a couple of days. So if I do this the same day, it was giving me an error because there was no data for the night yet. Um, it hadn't been input into the system, I guess. Um, so I took it off of here, figuring out, uh, figuring I can add it, I can add the weather data later. Um, and I can show that too. Uh, so that is that script also, I have so many windows here, I'm losing track here. So that script also, what it will do is 
um, it in the master, it will make these files. Um, it'll make an effort file for just, it should just have one record um, for how much effort was done that night. Yeah, and um, it'll make uh, individual calls. So each call will have a record in this file and then it will summarize the, the, the night's totals into these three. And then I have another uh, R script that I run to push it into these master files. And then here um, you can see all the nights I've done since I started doing this. And, and so that data is, so last year I took all my observations out of eBird. I was doing it manually. Uh, I would take the label track and throw it in Excel, sort it and, and tally it manually, but I didn't break it up by hour. It was just too much work. And so last year I took all that data and brought it into Tableau and made this with, so this is last year's, this is Tableau Public. This is last, this is using eBird data and this is last year's recording. So I just have little visuals. So this is, uh, these are all my totals for the season. Well, I started in May last year, but these are my totals. You can see fall much busier than, than um, spring and you can also, uh, go in here and just pick on individual birds. You can see individual birds, so way more Canada warbler in the fall than in the than in the spring. Um, you can see something like something like Swainson's thrush. Um, it's going to be the same thing. Way more in fall than the spring, but this I found fascinating. They don't yeah. nest. They don't nest here, but this early July movement was just something I had no idea of because they're so hard to detect on the ground. And there's this little blip that starts in July. And, and some people have said it's a molt right migration. And, and I have friends who've worked at, you know, Long Point Bird Observatory who said, yeah, we actually have caught them in nets in mid July before. So um, I found that totally fascinating. And then I just have, this is just my species totals for this, for the year. And then I had this, Fun little comparison page and you can change these species. I just have it defaulting to hermit thrush, swainch and stuff. So you can kind of see the timing of those species. Um, here you could do, I don't know, we could do some warblers because we know some warblers have different timing. You could do northern water thrush. That's an early one. one I hardly detect. Uh, Cape May warbler and uh, it's actually pretty early too, um, which is surprising. I don't think I don't think that's common knowledge that early August they're, they're, they're moving pretty, they're doing some pretty big movements in early August. And then maybe, uh, I don't know, I won't use yellow rump warbler because it's an ID I'm not totally confident on. Um, maybe, uh, it's a generic warbler. Ovenbird maybe? Where's Ovenbird at? Oh, yeah, um, and just, it's just some species comparisons for, for timing that I thought were fun. So I took that data out of eBird and stitched it back together. So now with this data, I might do the same thing, I might throw it in here eventually. Um, but I have, oh, sorry, where is it? Um, so if we go back, uh, go back here, I have um, this. This is what I initially started with. It's, uh, I'll open this and run this. Um, so this would be using this year's data and just puts it in a dashboard and I'm just scratching the surface, trying to learn R once again, trying to think I have weather data now that in this, this code is actually putting weather data on it. So I could, I could, if I wanted to do some sort of analysis of weather and weather in birds, now that I have it, now that I have each call down to the minute, which I didn't have last year because I had just an eBird record for the entire evening. I didn't have any time whatsoever I could do, you know, timing. What time are the birds going overhead? I could, I could pot potentially explore that sort of stuff. So I think this is far better what I'm doing this year, having every individual call, having a time associated with every individual call. It's what Vesper probably does and what makes Vesper really cool. Um, and yeah, so this is just a, a 
I can't share this, unfortunately. This is why I went with Tableau last year is because I can share Tableau. Um, this is just uh, HTML on my computer. I, I, can't, I can't share it, but here are my species totals for this year. Um, right, like white-throated sparrow is the most dominant. Um, Swings and stuff are starting to come through. I missed the three biggest days of the year because I was birding in Point Pelee. So um, those numbers would, should be way higher if I was if I was here to run it every day. Um, and then individual species graphs. So some of this is all stuff I'm still working on. But there's there's my biggest Virginia rail night, and that was I don't know April third, April fourth. If I was using a different plot in R, it could probably have like a hover over feature, right? So. Like I said, I'm learning this, and there's way better ways to do to do all of this. But uh, it's it's more just kind of proof of concept. Um, yeah, so we'll pick another, pick something like grasshopper sparrow. Another shocking one that I think most most NFCers know. They move a lot, <laughs> and they're very detectable. I had no clue. Um, and I'm not sure they'll keep going in the summer. I'm not sure if it's just because there's hay fields nearby or, or, or if the hay fields are being cut or what it is. But uh, yeah, I was shocked. Not a yard bird I ever really even dreamed of getting. And uh, well, it's not on my yard list because this is a nocturnal flight call count, but, um, but uh, you get the point. Um, yeah, so I've kind of rushed through that because there's a lot. I don't know if anybody wants to talk about or have any questions about specific parts of all that. Um, I mean, to set it up yourself, um, you would need R Studio, Audacity, R, you need R, sorry, um, R Studio, um, Audacity, and you need to edit those text files for your own needs. They don't have to be banding code. You can just use W for war or S. I might put S for Swainson's thrush if I'm, you know, if I'm, if it's the fall rolls around and I'm like, I don't want to write SW. TH every time a swings and thrush calls, I might just turn it to, to like you could you could totally tailor that list to whatever your specific um, codes were. Um, oh, the other thing I have to do. So the one thing I have to do, let me open that other script because I really should mention this, is the one thing you have to do for there's one step I missed. So if we open up the this. This is the one that takes the label tracks and turns it into the eBird upload file. I have to change this every night, which is a bit, I keep forgetting to do it. So it's a bit of a pain. I wish maybe I should label my label track, this label or something for it to work. And then I wouldn't have this problem, but I have to label it with the date. And then I have to put that start time that I uh, noted here because it's gonna build everything off of, uh, it's going to build everything off of that because my, the label track comes down with it. Like it start the label track starts at zero and goes. So you need to know when you actually started for it to do all the kind of calculations and manipulations. Um, I've commented this as best as I can, but uh, yeah, it's, as I said, it's a, uh, it's a bit of a hammer keys until stuff comes out the other end, double check it a bit to hope it works and then find out two days later, it, uh, you missed something. <laughs> yeah, so maybe I'll stop sharing now or, or I can keep my screen up. Um, are there any questions? Well, before questions, I just want to say that's, that's really awesome. Um, fantastic piece of, piece of effort, especially for a beginning programmer as a, as a fellow beginning programmer who's messed around with some things in this domain you've certainly come a lot farther than i did and and especially you know all the visualizations that you got out of it th those are massively satisfying I, I think that's fantastic um so i i really i really appreciate what you've done i i have not have not been disciplined enough to be able to uh to annotate full full things at that level of detail very many times I've, I've done it a few times um but i can't i can't keep up a rhythm of doing that every night no i uh, i i acknowledge that like uh i don't even know like i don't know if i could have done it without covid right with covid you're not leaving the house for vacations you're not you're you're at home um you're, you're like at the start of COVID, we weren't even birding, right? Like we weren't chasing rarities. We weren't right. So, uh, and the, the other thing is, um, I think if you ever were to apply this scientifically, 
right? That's where you would need, that's where like the standard detectors probably come into play because you're not leaving it up to human interpretation and, and you just can't pay someone to go through, like, let's say you set up a network of listening stations. You just can't pay someone to go through, you know, September 5th at 20 different listening stations. That's just unfeasible, right? Without those automations and without, so it might have limited long-term use, limited scientific use, but uh, it's the process that I came up with to make my life easier. I really like going through this, the, the, the spectrum. You never know what you're going to get. Like, it's like you wake up and it's like Christmas. It's especially after a good night here. You know, after a few hours, you might be, okay, stop it with the swings and thrushes. I'm not interested anymore, but um, I really like going through the, uh, I really like going through the, uh, the spectrogram. Um, um, one, one question has, have, have you been in touch with uh, Benjamin Van Doren um, about sharing your, sharing your audio files and, and your, your, your audacity annotations? Um, I think I posted the script on NFC in a, in no, no. a, in a separate post. No. Sorry. He, he wants something different. Want something he, different? He wants, he wants your audio files and your, your annotations of, you know, this far into the file, you know, the audacity files that say this far in there's a Swainson thrush and this far in there's a this, like, cause he's so... using that to train the detectors. And you've got <laughs> one, I mean, there's not that many people in the world who've done what you've done. You know, so... what I mean? it's happened a little bit, but you've got more than most. So there's a, I guess there's a couple of yeah, things to say about that. I started out, I probably still have them on. I ran out of space on my computer quite quickly. Started putting them on a hard drive. Needed to get another hard drive. And this is just one year's work, right? Yeah. So I probably have them at the start of this when I was probably a little less accurate, right? Yeah. Um, and then, and now this year, I delete them. Um, I, I still have space on my hard drive. I could plug them in and copy them. I do have like, so... Um, uh, like, uh, da, 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 da. if we open up my files, where did my files go? Come on. Yeah. So I'll work in, um, I'll work in here. Right. So I've had to clear space off. So I only have so, that to, so here's my May 5th, right. There's my label track. Here are the clips that I wanted to upload to, um, upload to eBird. Uh, I think I find around here, there's a lot of skepticism sometimes to this. And I'm like, that's fine. Like, yeah, like I just, I'll just load as much stuff as I can. And you can decide if it's right or it's wrong. Well, I, I don't like that. It's no skin off my, sh my shoulders. Right. So I just load a lot. Plus I love, I load a ton because I really love going into eBird and having my, uh, and being able to see what I'm calling, you know, I might've called something wrong or so. Um, let me fire. Where's, where's, where's eBird? This thing at the top is really messing with me. Um, so if we go to my eBird account and there's my bucket. Um, if we go to view all, I can, any species, uh, I don't know, um, grasshopper sparrow, right? That's one. This one we're all near and dear to our NFC ears hearts. Then go grasshopper, sparrow. Some of them are, lots of them are probably flag uh, are unconfirmed because they they probably were high counts for grasshopper, sparrow, right? Yeah. So, but I can go, but um, I can go in and I can say unconfirmed, and I can see my, you know, my entire repertoire of what I've been calling. So if ever something comes up and I want to compare it to something previous, I've got like hundreds of these, right? Yeah, um, kind of. I kind of like. You shouldn't be loading media to eBird that you don't, you know, you don't trust. But it's. Um, but I figure this is my evidence of what I'm calling what right or wrong, and I find it just a like I'm using it as my own personal database, which is awesome. It might not be what they intend, but man, I love it. Well, I I think I think they would rather there be media. 
to back up your records. And if it's wrong, it can be shown to be wrong. And if it's right, it can be shown to be right. I, I think I think there's vast, vast value in, in adding the media. But um, I would say before you start deleting any more old stuff, um, Benjamin will give you a folder and you can upload the audio file before you delete it. It'll take a while to upload, of course, because those wave files are huge. But, you know, if you do it before you go to bed or something. So does he want, because I don't always, I used to always do this, but I don't always do this anymore. Does he want, which one would have it? Sometimes I just go through it so fast, I don't save it as a project. But this file here, this project file. He wants the wave file, not the project file. But this, whatever. This project file will have the, uh, it probably needs the, it probably needs the wave file as well. But it will have all the labels in it too, right? Oh, so. yeah. If, if you uploaded the project files, I'm sure he's very tech savvy. He, he would be able to to separate it out he wants the wave file and the label track yeah that, yeah that wouldn't, be, that wouldn't be hard to do i don't think yeah i mean it's just very slow to upload on my home wi-fi um sometimes i take my laptop to work so that i can upload it from there just because it <laughs> is faster um, but anyway um yeah I, like i do i do think there's value in all of this right i just i just started like i couldn't i couldn't you know like i mean I could, but I couldn't really justify buying a terabyte hard drive every year, every half year, right? Like, so I just, I just stopped. I just, uh, um, I just stopped saving them. So, but I do have some stuff, and I can moving forward. And I do have some of my early stuff as well that 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 didn't uh, that filled up those hard drives. So, yeah, that's that's cool. Yeah, because and that's where I so, thought that's where I thought Vesper was heading, right? Saving each call, saving the saving yeah. the, uh, saving the timestamp for each call, saving the identification for each call. So, right, and and what we need to do is we need to close the loop because we know that we need automation, but we humans are so much better than the automated systems now that the automated systems need to hear our. You know, we need to teach it what's a Virginia rail and what's a Swainson thrush and what's a peeper. And, you know, we we need to be feeding that back into the training data. And to do that, you need the, the original audio files and the annotations of where in the files is the sound. Um, I'll try to I'll try to talk to him and uh, maybe get some more details from him. Yeah, I can I can put an email with with you guys together to say, but. It was it was very easy for him to just create a folder for me to put my stuff in it, and then you know he'll he'll get to it when he gets to it. But yeah. Uh, anyway, open to the floor. Anybody else have questions? Sorry, just just one quick one. So you you mentioned that he likes he would like some of this data to train the um, the neural networks or um, yeah. I think you used another word for it. Um, a uh, problem that I find here is I, I've tried using Vesper. The first problem is the Bahamas is a low-lying country. I think our highest elevation is 300 feet. <laughs> um, so it makes uh, uh, identifying a little bit of uh, an issue. Another thing is is the, uh, the amphibians that we have around as well as some of the uh, Bahamian specialties, red-legged thrushes, and uh, a few other species of birds, um, they're not able to be detected as well um, because it's a new call. Um, I was just wondering if this is a U.S. and Canada-based effort, or would it be open to, you know, starting to process some of that data for the Bahamas, uh, starting uh, uh, and putting that into the network? Um, I can't speak for, for any of those guys, but... I think in the long run, um, I mean, for example, in the short term, if you had an annotation for a species that they weren't working on, then I suppose they wouldn't use that bit of the annotation in the training data. Um, so whatever, but I think in the long term, the vision is, you know, the, the biome, you know, that these these identification systems like iNaturalists visualization tries to do every life form, you know, and obviously they're not close yet, but that's where they're going. Um, and so I think I think the the future is detectors that 
try to identify all nocturnal sounds. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it'll be a while yet. Um, but I, I think, I think it would be a good contribution, uh, even if it doesn't get put to use as soon as the, the, you know, North Northeast is, is where most of the progress is, has been, you know, started, but you look at Merlin, you know, it, it performs better in Northeastern U S than it does in Europe, but yeah, they're making progress in Europe. And I'm sure in five years, the European detectors will be good. So. It doesn't, it doesn't also have to be equally good at all species, right? We know that, you know, like uh, land surveys, like breeding bird atlas detect certain species better than others, right? So it's not like, I mean, it's not like every species, I mean, the goal shouldn't be <laughs> every species is perfectly detected, right? Like, um, yeah. Not realistic. But yeah, I, 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 so one other thing that I can chime in there is, Harold said that one of his long-term visions is that the neural networks will be able to train off your own um, station. So that they, that instead of having one identification system, that there may be one that's tuned well to your background noise on your mic and has been tuned to the species and even the calling individuals like you know your own mockingbird or whatever would be particularly emphasized or weighted in your training data um i don't think that's anywhere near to happen but it's it makes sense logically that you can put weights in a neural network training system and that as computers become faster being able to run those things more than you know right now it's it's prohibitive on a fast computer to to make the neural network in the first place but assuming that computers continue to get faster you might be able to have your own detector that's based on your own training and even if you're still the only one doing nfc's in bahamas you'll have you'll have the the chris johnson detector you know yeah yeah thank you that that definitely helps and it uh shed some light on it. I definitely appreciate it. Thank you. Least bitterns. How many of them you got? I get them every night. I don't know why. I don't get them every night, but this is like June, right? Like they're, they're not migrating anymore. Why, do I, why are they going to my house all the time? Are they not migrating? I'm just trying to, show, trying to just not know. Yeah, maybe maybe it's water levels. Maybe maybe they do display flights. Like maybe they commute like three blue herons. Like there's a lot of uh, this county is a lot of um, a lot of uh, well the south end the north end is shield so it's just bush and rock but the south end is um, a lot of hay and, and hedgerow and um, like low lying swamps in between in between all the like the the moraines and the eskers so we do have a lot of virginia rail a lot of soar and a lot of these bitter and they move around nightly um and and i think they are local because they don't always line up with weather good weather good movement days right so i don't know just thought i'd show it because this is some of the cool stuff that um like i'm not sure what my total total birds per night least bitter was sorry species total mm, where is it Fork by name, least bitter in 44, Sora 44. So these numbers are all quite close. Virginia Rail would be more, I think. Um, wait, I need to do a taxonomy. Um, other way. So it matches eBird, 117 Virginia Rail. And I started probably after a lot of move as well. So um, cuckoos. Lots of local cuckoos. These are probably mostly June numbers too. So just stuff I never knew, right? And there's other people who've been doing this longer who know this already and are sitting on gold mine of data, but for me it was all new.
bobble ink. I'm surprised at how few bobble ink I get because I get them every morning, morning flight, you know, maybe on a decent morning, five to 10, we'll go over the house. But well, I got hardly any at, uh, I got hardly any at night. Huh. Um, like I said, hermit thrush, I haven't got a single one this spring. But, um, but if we look at the, uh, if we look at like a, like other thrushes, um, uh, do, 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 like there's Swainson's. What am I doing? Why can't I figure out alphabetical order right now? I think I'm toast. Swainson's there. So yeah, like there was a night with 196. Why am I getting no hermit thrush? I, I just like they're showing up in my like. Well, not I don't get many, but like I might get, you know, three or four in my yard in a spring. So they're 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 going through, but they're not not detected. I'm curious if Jeff Stewart, who also records in this county, has gotten any um gotten any hermit thrushes. I should ask him. I, I certainly don't get as many hermit thrushes as Swainson's, but I get them fairly regularly at the right time of year. So you get you you'd get like over a hundred in the spring at least I'm imagining or yeah I've I've never analyzed the whole spring every night um, but uh, I I think yeah I would be on pace for maybe a hundred and this is the one night they all went through the Swainson's thrushes right so. I just wow and that's after the last reported one on the ground in the county I just just fascinating. It is fascinating. Late too, like that's June, I think. No, it's May 31st. That's 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 late. Gray cheek thrush would have been um, like similar, probably went through the same night, I'm guessing. Uh, so the same night. Yeah, same night. Right? Not as many, but one, one of the things that I find cool that's relevant to today is, so like last night, um, there was great migration to the south of us, but it was raining from like dusk all the way through till 2 a.m. And then it slowed down by Mark. Um, it slowed down the rain. It was still raining, but softly at 2 a.m. And it was suddenly just tons tons of swains and thrushes and like least sandpipers um and uh, you know maybe just like half a dozen warblers i, I mainly analyzed the the three three a.m to four a.m uh, but it started at two and uh yeah it's just like really really heavy flight and it was still like during the drizzle when the heaviest bird flight was which is something like i, I at one time i had put a lot of effort into trying to get my computer to turn off or stop recording when it was raining. And then I kept getting good birds in the rain and I stopped that effort. Um, but anyway. Uh, I think, I think um, one thing that allows me or allowed me to go through the whole year last year as well is that uh, I think I get as many calls as some of you to the South, right? So my biggest swings and stretch day in the fall would be 565 and I've heard of stories of people in the states with like 10,000 in a night right so um like I saw that night and it was it overwhelmed me like I said it probably took me like a week right um, to get through it I all can't, I can't believe how 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 much Andy Wilson does because he gets so many more calls and he's been analyzing every night for so long he's he's really really dedicated yeah for sure Cool. Well, I think we should sign off. I'm all excited now, but I should I should go to bed. So I'm getting up early. Um, but thank you, Ian. That was that was really awesome. Um, I don't know if if anybody out there is going to be tech savvy enough to uh, um, uh, put all this put all this together. But it doesn't look like too big of a stretch if if we try your code and it works. Um, not too big of a stretch. It's just the intricacies of my own process, like my own codes. You'd have to go in and do your own codes or use my codes. Like I call, I've been starting to call like WU for Warbler upsweeps, WZ for Warbler zeeps, because that doesn't go into eBird, but that could go into 
my um, that could go into this if I wanted to to break those up. If I wanted to try to see if there was you know a, a Z pump early when yellow warblers start going, I, I could potentially do that. So I started labeling like that. That's just that's no code. That's just my own made up code, right? So. Um, that's kind of the part that people would have to grapple with. And then, you know, labeling everyone and then labeling the repeat callers is just, that's that's kind of a personal thing. That's, that's kind of how I do it. Um, um, yeah, people would just have to figure out how to tie it into their own processes, I think. Well, it's the logical thing to do if you put in the effort. And I think, you know, if you're not, if you're not, overwhelmed by huge nights it's it's definitely doable and and the right it's the right thing to do cool well uh thanks again and thanks everybody for for coming and i uh, i guess i'll i'll put the recording on the on the uh group i guess i'll probably put it back into one of those comment chains where where this this process was laid out in the first place well that'd be great I appreciate everyone listening and, and being patient with me. And uh, yeah, thanks, everybody. Cool. Okay, good night, all.